Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Tobin, and I'm the Associate Director of Middle East Studies. I'll be serving as the moderator this afternoon. Our three speakers on the panel of Turkey uh, are Jean Atchiksuz, Sinan Guknur, and Emra Yildiz. First up, we have uh, Jean Atchiksuz, who is an Associate Professor of Middle Eastern and North African Studies at the University of Arizona. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you all the organizers, especially dear Said, uh, for putting together this panel. Uh, I'm very humbled and uh, very happy to be here presenting uh, my work in progress. Actually, this is a collaborative work uh, that, I've, that I have undertaken with uh, feminist sociologist Zeynep Korkman. Uh, and I will share with you our pro provisional thoughts on the gender and sexual politics of the 2013 Gezi uprising in Turkey. And this is, as I mentioned, still work in progress, and I will highly appreciate your valuable comments and insights. In my talk, I will situate the Gezi uprising within the context of the increasingly masculinized neoconservatism and authoritarianism of the neoliberal Islamist Justice and Development Party, and show how the language and symbolism of Gezi uprising was forged in a dynamic relationship with the particular gendered power embodied by the PM and now President Erdogan. And here is a very sweet picture of him. It says, you're very sweet. This is one of the billboards that was designed to uh, sort of de demasculinize him uh, during the protests. Uh, I will demonstrate in my talk how the gender dialectic between the Justice and Development Party rule, hands forward JDP, and the resistance movement created unique moments for the queer political articulation of LGBTIQ and feminist movements and male working class and lumpen proletariat sociabilities such as uh, sucker fan groups. My use of queer here is informed by the recent, recent reconceptualizations of queerness as a radical potential that, on, that not only questions normative frameworks of sexuality, particularly heteronormativity, but also exceeds and challenges identitarian structures of capitalism, sexism, racism, and compulsory ableism. Let's see whether it's red. Okay. Here are some pics from the Gezi protests that shook the country for weeks uh, until they were killed by uh, part of police violence uh, after three weeks. So I'll give you some background on the Gezi protests and the uprising since we we'll all mentioned uh, it in our talks. The Gezi Park protests started in May 2013 when a broad coalition of activists, including feminist and LGBT groups, began an Occupy movement style sitting in Gezi Park, an important cruising and political activism space for the LGBT community, and one of the few remaining green belts in the Taksim area. Taksim, the cosmopolitan cultural and political center of Istanbul, had long been one of the most politically charged urban spaces as the symbol of the working class struggle, as the center of the contestations between secularists and Islamists, but also as the focal point of the neoliberal urban renewal policies of the Justice and Development Party, which sought to develop the area into a refurbished touristic and shopping center. The government was planning to demolish Gezi Park and chop down its hundreds of trees turns out to be without a permit and legal permission to, constru to construct a postmodern replica of a late Ottoman military barracks that would serve as a shopping mall and uh, probably to, to the Gulf tourists uh, most prominently. When protesters halted the demolition through peaceful means, they faced with a fierce police crackdown and uh, the this police crackdown became particularly, I don't know whether you can see, through this image of the woman in red, who was, you know, this woman uh, that is being sprayed on excessive quantities of, co quantities of pepper gas and tear spray. Uh, so this became the, the symbol of the police violence. And the anger over police violence started to increase the number of protesters. And each time, they were faced with more police violence until it turned into an uprising. 
Uh, eventually, uh, millions of citizens took to the streets, not only in Istanbul, but throughout Turkey, to voice their grievances about the government's authoritarian, neoconservative, and anti-secular blend of neoliberalism. And obviously, there, are, there were multiple grievances, because this was a broad coalition that enrolled so many different social groups and political actors. But arguably, what united the grievances from protesters from all walks of life was their stance against Justice and Development Party's increasing authoritarianism personified by and performed through the arrogant, condescending, and contemptuous gendered political persona of the Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan. And here you can see some of his pictures scalding uh, numerous figures ranging from ordinary citizens to other parliament members. Recep Tayyip Erdogan embodies a very particular gendered polit political persona that relies on an innovative synthesis of Islamist and lower class urban masculinities. This masculine synthesis has been one of the main pedestals of his political charisma and successful political career for over a decade in a country that regularly has that, that had uh, several coalitions and many different prime ministers before his coming to power. It is impossible to analyze his, his uh, masculine political persona in detail within the confines of his thought, but let me give just a few examples. Hailing from an urban tough neighborhood, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan continuously performs the traditional Kabadai neighborhood tough figure Machismo, aggressiveness, and foul mouthedness are his political signatures. He intervenes very aggressively and personally in all aspects of citizens' public and private conduct, ranging from smoking to child delivery methods. He is also an active uh, football player, an ex professional football player, and you may know that football is the biggest male religion in Turkey. And, and just like his role model, uh, Vladimir Putin, the judoist, he loves to publicly demonstrate uh, his skills. Obviously, this is a very masculine performance as well. AKP, uh, Justice and Development Party branch, uh, women's branch representatives often and numerously state, to become an AKP member, JDP member, is to be bonded to Erdogan with marriage. Within the party circles, he is hailed as the Pater Familias, the Great Master, the Chief, and more recently, the Uzun Adam, which can be translated into English as the Tall or the Long Man. And you can see you know, his, his uh, tall stature is being emphasized as this kind of political thing here. And there's no need to analyze in front of this audience the symbolic power and, and sexual connotations of the length issue, but let me just say, that uh, someone found on Academia, uh, our article on Erdogan's masculinity by Google searching Erdogan's penis size. So the size and the tallness of the guy uh, are just you know, seen and kind of uh, used as emblematic of his masculine political charisma. Turkey under the rule of Erdogan can be understood through Lauren Berlant's theory of infantile citizenship which Berlin uses to analyze the post-Reagan cultural counter-revolution through which questions of intimacy, sexuality, reproduction, and the family became central to the organization of US citizenship. The AKP policies increasingly signaled at the encroachment of a feminist and queer dystopia in which non-family-centered and non-reproductive sociabilities and sexualities were excluded from the national order and even criminalized. And examples abound uh, from the pronatalist shift and the increasing limitations on abortion to police crackdowns on mixed gender cohabitations and the shutting down of the LGBT organizations in the name of public morality. Just before Gezi protests, Erdogan recommended that Turkish women have at least three children and supported an alcohol ban. And in early days of the protest, warned families that their daughters were sitting on men's laps in Gezi Park to, de to delegitimize the resistance movement. In other words, he had once again deployed the familial and kinship metaphors to enact the role of a husband who wanted three kids 
a father who forbids drinking at night, and an elder brother who snitches on his sister for socializing with males. However, in the course of the Gezi resistance, his gendered intimacy with Turkish citizens would take an unprecedented turn. On the morning of July the 1st, exhausted from the first night of clashes with the riot police, but still upbeat, the crowd of young male soccer fans with eyes red from tear gas started to chant, go on spray, go on spray, go on spray tear gas, strip your helmet, drop your baton, and let's see who the real man is in order to taunt the police. This would prove to be the mo one of the most popular slogans and arguably the most popular slogan of the protests. The political language of the resistance personified by the soccer fan group Charshu, you can see their famous march I can see on the top, top left corner, was speaking in the lingo of urban poor male youth to challenge the policemen for a manly fight. The same lingo was also visible on the walls covered with sexually offensive graffiti swear words targeting Prime Minister Erdogan. And these kind of graffiti uh, was everywhere in Istanbul and all, with all kinds of uh, swear words. The slogans attacking Erdogan's masculine honor deployed the same cultural idiom that he used and despite or perhaps exactly because of this they became the voice of the masses resisting Erdogan's masculinized exercise of power. In other words, precisely because he played the role of the father, brother, and the husband, uh, the supposedly apolitical language of the resistance targeted Erdogan's masculinity through swear words questioning his penis size, heterosexuality, and impenetrability. The language of the resistance engaged with, questioned, and answered Erdogan through the imperatives of hegemonic masculinity, and in so doing, it mimicked, tainted, reversed his masculinized power, turning the gendered politics of the security state inside out, to paraphrase uh, Amar's uh, phrase. What gave Gezi its popularity and street militancy was the incorporation of this masculine language, which on the one hand created a space of patriarchal dignity to question and resist political authority. On the other hand, however, the sexist, homophobic, and transphobic undertones of this language othered women, LGBT individuals, and sex workers who constituted integral elements of the resistance movement. As a response, feminist and LGBT activists reclaimed, transformed, and queered this resistance language through different strategies. They covered heterosexist graffiti on walls with purple paint, as you can see in the top corner picture, urged no cursing of women, gays, and whores, subverted, chanted, for example, by substituting see the gays for see the real men, contributed their own slogans, such as Taip and harassment free zone, and encouraged everyone to transform their language by inviting them to resist by persevering, not by swearing, and that was one of the famous slogans. We know, for example, from debates on pornography and homonationalism, that gender and sexual politics can reproduce bourgeois morality and politics of respectability in class-blind ways. What was remarkable in the Gezi case was the queer utopic horizon of the affective political assemblage, in which tensions among resistance subjects contributed to their learning from each other in ways that disrupted their identitarian positions, even if ephemeral. During the protests, sex workers carried placards that read, we, the whores, are certain that Tayyip is not our child, in response to the swearing slogans against Erdogan. Feminist and LGBT activists experimented with the performative power of rage and swearing by organizing swearing workshops. Such subversive strategies proved useful in the reconstruction of the Gezi experience as a model for a new public space and political morality, which offered women and especially LGBT individuals not only relative freedom from harassment, sexual violence, and hate crimes, but also new and unexpected forms of alliances. During the protests, soccer fan groups decided not to use fag as an insult 
and they replaced uh, the famous song of the of the protest, Tayyip Sak My Sexual Parse, with Kuki Tayyip song, which according to the leaked ele alleged corruption tapes, angered the advisors of the Prime Minister more than the original version. And this is this was a Kuki uh, Tayyip image that was circulating in the media. Uh, one of the best examples of this new humorous engagement with masculinized power was the circulation of Helium Tayyip songs all over the internet. Uh, and you know, but I didn't know why it was called Helium Tayyip. Obviously, when you uh, inhale helium gas, it makes your voice uh, kind of squeaky. And uh, making fun of the prime minister whose voice got squeaky, most probably due to his excessive masculine style of public speaking during Gezi protests, these songs reveal the performative and drag character of his masculinity and masculine power. And I was planning to uh, play these songs, but we don't have time, so maybe after, after the panel. And what remained out of these alliances? Uh, because fan groups uh, mostly reverted back to their sexist language, uh, to give an example. But solidarity with LGBT movements definitely expanded. The 2013 and 2014 LGBT Pride March following Gezi protests attracted tens of thousands of people, for example. LGBT symbols like the rainbow flag and slogans like, where are you my love, were popularized, appropriated, and mainstreamed. Immediately after Gezi, an act of guerrilla beautification triggered, triggered a new wave of anti-government protests during which public spaces, especially stairs, were painted in rainbow colors all over Turkey. And here you can see one image, and there are numerous of them uh, from all over Turkey. The pro-Kurdish People's Democracy Party semi-officially adopted the rainbow flag and LGBT political demands, also declaring 10% quota for LGBT individuals in its electoral list, uh, although it's questionable whether this translated into practice. Uh, Sedef Çakmak, in the local elections, uh, last local elections, Sedef Çakmak, the first openly declared LGBTI politician, oh, sorry, here, was elected to public office as a Republican People's Party Municipal Assembly member. Uh, all, these are all limited but important gains. But in the spirit of this, this uh, conference, I want to close with optimistically drawing attention to another and irreversible gain of the Gezi experience. The unusual coexistences and political coalitions that were forged under the atmospheric violence of tear gas clouds shrouding the Gezi park opened windows to our imagination of a fragile and fleeting queer utopia, which is not yet here. As the graffiti on the Gezi park reads, it is as if revolution has been. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Sinem Guknur, who is a queer activist. Um, one of the ways that Gizm Uprising uh, has become famous, as uh, John already spoke about a little bit, is uh, protesters' use of humorous and subversive tactics against government authority and police brutality. Uh, protesters attempted to short circuit the logic of suppression and expected opposition by doing things like chasing away the riot police vehicles with hijacked construction machines, which were at the site for the uh, park's demolition, or things like chanting at the police that they got mass addicted to the tear gas, and therefore they were not going to disperse. Subversion is oftentimes used when the system cannot be fought with internal or legitimate tools. In Turkey, radical left, Ethnic and religious minorities, queers and feminists alike, have been marginalized not only by the current uh, JDP regime, but also by the previous military regime that JDP has, uh, the government, that the JDP government has displayed. This uh, double marginalization has rendered these groups outside of the mainstream political dialectic between the ruling JDP and the military nationalists, uh, by some people's definition, center left movement in Turkey and force them to think subversively for a politics beyond the confines of the binary opposition between the current status quo and the prior status quo. 
In my opinion, queer movement's most valuable political contribution in Turkey has been this double resistance to the uh, JDP government's neoliberal Islamism on the one hand, and the main opposition's military nationalism and state centrism on the other hand. Queer movement was not alone in doing this. Lambda Istanbul alone, the organization that I worked with, organized and participated in uh, numerous panels with feminists, anti-militarists, anti-capitalists, and anti-nationalists to build coalitions against the patriarchal, moralist, capitalist, and nationalist politics of oppression that were unchecked in the mainstream. From this angle, the most meaningful contribution of the Gezi movement for me becomes its uh, ability to make visible such alter opposition politics to the larger public. Beyond its feminist implications, alter opposition movements in Turkey are significant because by rejecting both, they are exposing the misleading dichotomy and opposition set between Muslim conservative Democrats and Islamists on the one hand, and secular military nationalists on the other hand. These uh, right-wing and, as I said by uh, some people's standards, center-left conservative forces have clashed and aligned over the years at different decades, but they have consistently been on the side of capital and patriarchal control. And their shared complicity in exploitative capitalism, chauvinism, and heterosexism necessitated queer and feminist politics to take shape in the realm of the grassroots. Beside taking shape out of the mainstream political field, these groups have also been criticizing political analysis that have relied on binary and oppositional frameworks, mostly to point out that beneath their surface antagonisms, the two poles of the political field in Turkey constitute a hegemonic power block against minority movements. I think a little bit of historical background may help clarify what I mean here. The relationship between Muslim conservatives and military nationalists went sour during the 1997 uh, military proclamation, during which military prioritized an anti-Islamist anti agenda and secularity became a critical nationalistic value to defend. Prior to this, however, particularly during the 1980 military coup, conservative Muslims, liberal capitalists, Cold War Democrats, and military nationalists were all on the same boat against workers, Kurds, and communists. The political history of the Turkish Republic is intervened with two military coups and three military proclamations set apart approximately by 10 years. And each time the political agenda along with the result resulting alliances and animosities have shifted and reorganized. For instance, although the military went after the conservative Democrats in 1960, by the time the 1980 coup happened, military was economically aligned and politically tolerant of the Muslim conservative Democrats of the time. The 1980s agenda for the military was to crush the left, as well as the Kurdish liberation movement that had Marxist-Leninist roots, and as such fit well with the Reagan-era rollback <coughs> movement against communism. Perhaps a common penchant for US-style capitalism and the common dislike of the communists mended the broken hearts from 1960s and cultivated the relationship between the Turkish military and the conservative Democrats during 70s and 80s that lasted until late 90s. The 80s coup crushed the labor movement and outlawed political organizing in Turkey. And the junta generals appointed a famous conservative Muslim Democrat as the deputy prime minister. He was put in charge of the economy and received military support in his liberalization of the economy and the implementation of IMF stabilization policies. At the same time, the same generals were employing ultra-nationalists for paramilitary attacks on Kurds and communists, while also courting Islamists by citing verses from Quran, praising Islam, and making religion an obligatory list in public education. I don't have enough time to tease out why I see this more as a uh, political gesture towards Islamists rather than a state infringement or power grab in the field of religion, but we can talk about that. Uh, the 80s coup did not only go after the socialists, however, but also went after what the military generals had deemed as social degenerates. During the junta years, even flamboyancy was outlawed. Queer entertainers, including a high-profile transsexual singer, was banned from appearing in public, and many transsexual sex workers were rounded up, rounded up imprisoned, and tortured by security forces. The conservative Democrat deputy prime minister of the junta government later ran for office and came into power in 1983. During this time, the ban on high-profile transsexual singer was eventually lifted, and the civil law was adjusted to accommodate her official transition from male to female in 19, 
1988. However, along with these social relaxation policies, late 80s and 90s also ushered in the media smear campaigns as well as increased police and citizen violence against transsexuals, which was especially exacerbated during the sex workers' resistance against an early wave of urban gentrification projects in Istanbul in the mid-90s. Even the gender transition law in uh, transgender collective memory is coupled with the government field corruption and push towards privatization in state services, including the medical system, and the ensuing phenomenon of market-driven doctors that left many transsexual women with failed results because they did not have proper qualifications. In other words, Violence and discrimination were continuous while their terms were adjusting to the recently established market capitalism and gentrification economy that became prominent in the 90s. It wasn't until the threat of communism completely eradicated, the economy liberalized and opened up to the market and the anti-Kurdish anti policies, such as the language ban, gotten integrated into the constitution that conservative Muslims, once an ally in fighting the left and the social degenerates, became the new rising threat for the military. The 1997 military proclamation forced the newly elected Islamist prime minister to resign, and interestingly enough, the next year in 1998, Islamists and the secular Republicans got locked in a who is the real nationalist here, kind of a political battle over the foundation myths of the Turkish Republic, fueling both groups' claims over the original ownership of the state. Uh, actually, Esra Ezrek has a great chapter on this, titled Islamist Subversion of Republican Nostalgia, this battle not only subverted the Republican nostalgia, but also yielded at least two distinct and clashing kinds of nationalisms, Islamist versus secular, and thereby threatened the very unitary ideal of nationalism. This is something uh, that continues to evolve and uh, take form uh, today under the ruling uh, JDP party as neo-Ottoman nationalism versus the uh, opposition party's Republican nationalism. Between 1997 and 2002, until the first time election of the current J party JDP, various center-right and center-left party coalitions took place. In 2002, JDP brought together Islamists and conservative Democrat, uh, Democrats under its umbrella and as such became the political opponent of the secular militarists. In addition to their entangled history that I tried to outline here though, the JDP regime and the center-left, which is now associated with the secular militarism, also shared neoliberal aspirations for the economy. The neoliberal economic program of the JDP government can be traced back to the 2001 structural economic reforms executed by a center-left party government. As a matter of fact, the deputy prime minister elected during JDP's first form as a guarantor of the successful continuation and implementation of these reforms continue to serve in the uh, current cabinet. Despite such historical, political, and economic entanglements and commonalities, public have largely been polarized between these two misleading poles, and politics in Turkey started to look a lot like the superficial opposition between the US Republicans versus Democrats here. The Kurdish party has been disrupting this dynamic to an extent, yet prior to its reorganization after the Gezi uprising, the party got about 6% of the general votes as opposed to the 30-40% uh, shares between the GDP and the main opposition. Most of the constituents or the destituents of the Gezi uprising, such as the LGBT bloc or the feminists, have been rejecting and subverting the mainstream polar discourses and instead pushing for political change outside of the confines of these misleading binaries. A couple of examples, I think, uh, will be illustrated here. The first case is the never-ending persecution of Pnar Selek. Pnar Selek is an anti-militarist feminist activist and a sociologist who had been framed by the Turkish state in 1998. In 1997, Pınar has been researching in the Kurdish region in Turkey, and uh, throughout her research, she was exposing violence and intimidation tactics of the Turkish military used against the civilians. The next year, she was accused of being responsible for an ambiguous explosion uh, that caused civilian deaths, and over the last 17 years, she had been tried and retried with a life sentence and even though she had gotten acquitted four times, the state still continues to reopen her case with the same charges. During the early years of AKP, well before uh, AKP, meaning the Justice and Development Party, uh, JDP, before, well before their own authoritarian wave of incarcerations and censorship started in Turkey, feminists and LGBT supporters of uh, Pınar Selek were 
calling out GDP government for standing behind the 1997 military mentality when it comes to the persecution of an anti-militarist feminist. The second case is the uh, heated debates that took place particularly in the mid-2000s uh, between the secular versus Islamist Islamists. Feminists as well as LGBT women refused to be pulled into the secular versus Islamist framework about issues around gender and sexuality, but rather insisted on ex exposing gender discrimination, heterosexism, and patriarchal violence prevalent in both the secular state and the Islamist discourse. For instance, forced virginity examinations in the case of states or the uh, organized push for abortion ban in the case of Islamist pol politics, homophobia, of course, across the board, transphobia, transphobia you name it, as well as protection for men who commit uh, violence and crimes against women, they are protected by both the state and the, and the Islamists. In conclusion, the political landscape driven by the binary opposition between the current ruling party JDP on the one hand and the secular military nationalists on the other hand masks the hegemonic bloc that these camps constitute against movements that engage issues such as capitalist exploitation, patriarchal control, chauvinism, military violence, homophobia, discrimination and oppression against minority or otherwise marginalized populations, so on and so forth. In the aftermath of Gizi, the Kurdish party reorganized itself and started to incorporate uh, political demands of uh, grassroots groups that have been working on these issues, which I find as a, uh, as a positive development. But besides the potential parliamentary implications of this, or beyond, it's uh, the politics of recognition. I find this a remarkable in intervention into the surface politi uh, polarities of politics in Turkey coming from the efforts of grassroots activists and their perseverance against being manipulated by grand narratives, whether they come from media, politicians, or academia. Thank you, Sam. Next, we have Emre Yildiz who is a PhD candidate in Anthropology and Middle East Studies at Harvard University. Can you hear me fine? Yes, perfect. So first of all, thank you very much to Saad for the invitation. Um, I'm honored to be here, and thank you again for, um, to everyone who made this possible. Um, I'm going to share some of my work in progress, um, and my talk today is um, titled Cruising Politics, Sexuality, Solidarity and Political Life of Modularity in Turkey. Okay. On June 28, 2013, the inhabitants of Kayacik village in the Lija district of Diyarbakir, located in Turkey's Kurdistan, gathered to protest the ongoing construction of a kalekol, a high-tech military post with automated weapon capabilities. Lija has, long, has a long history of state violence. It had been repeatedly burned down by the so-called anti-terrorism operations of the Turkish state in the 1990s. These operations claimed hundreds, if not thousands of lives, buried in undisclosed mass graves to this day. They forced even more people to migrate to the metropoles in the west of the country for work and subsistence. Like Cizre, Yüksekova, Silopi, and many other sites in Turkey's Kurdistan, Lije is better approached as a historical laboratory for understanding the various technologies of annihilation, assimilation, and displacement, which the Turkish state has programmatically unleashed on its Kurdish populations since at least the times of the Jean Turk. This time around, the brutal, the brutal military response to the protest left nine people wounded and claimed the life of an 18-year-old protester, Medeni Yildirim. All this took place in the middle of yet another peace process underway between the Turkish state on the one hand and the Kurdish, Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK, um, guerrillas, and the larger Kurdish movement on the other. The news of the deadly military response spread quickly through social media, and a protest march from Galatasaray Square to Taksim Square was called at 6 p.m. the following day in Istanbul. This day also happened to be the sixth day of the 21st LGBT Pride Week-themed resistance in Istanbul. In light of these calls for protests, the Alliances and Oppositions Panel aimed at discussing the LGBT and queer community's solidarity with other oppositional groups after Gezi was immediately postponed. All participants at the event were subsequently encouraged to join the ranks of the protesters at the Galatasaray Square. When LGBT and queer uh, individuals marched towards Taksim Square with their rainbow flags, the slogan protesters chanted included, everywhere is Lije, 
everywhere is resistance, and resist lije same sexers or ishtin salal in Turkish are with you. Shortly after the march started to dissipate, following a sit-in protest in Taksim Square, the second and the biggest social gathering organized under the auspices of the Pride Week got underway at Garaj Istanbul, a concert hall also located in Taksim. After deliberations about canceling it all together in the midst of another round of disproportionate violence by the Turkish state on the highly charged grounds of Lijet, the Pride Party featuring an unplugged performance by the Kurdish singer Aynur Doğan went on. Protest chants in solidarity with Lijet repeatedly interrupted, or rather provided the core to the performance. In the midst of overwhelming news reporting and political analyses of the resistance from a variety of perspectives, the LGBT and queer community's presence at Gezi Park has been reduced to a curfew footnote, a footnote indexing the liberal and open-minded nature of the nascent alignment of resistance at Gezi Park. From analyses of the changing cultural outlook of Marxist and socialist political formations and shifting parameters of class relations in Turkey to those that address the sustainability of the resistance movement in the near future, the presence of the LGBT and queer um, communities in the Gizi protests escaped critical scrutiny in English and Turkish language media alike. Contrary to this overwhelming tendency, I want to center my analysis on these individuals and their collective political action at Gezi and beyond it. The stories I chronicle here um, from and beyond Gezi push our analyses of political action and sexuality beyond familiar frameworks that either posit the latter as an effect of neo-imperial neo cultural forms making their way into the Middle East or present their protection and toleration as the litmus test, the latest lit litmus test, I'm sorry, of how liberal, and de how liberal democratic a state is in the so-called homonationalist facet of modernity. Transposing the analytic of modularity inspired by Mani Goswami's critique of Benedict Anderson's imagined communities into studies of sexuality and solidarity in the Middle East, I claim that lessons distilled from the LGBT bloc in heavy Istanbul could help us rethink the alleged homonationalist alignment of modern state power and political claims advanced through the idiom of sexuality. On September 22nd, 2013, Istam a heavy Istanbul Kurdish initiative declared its formation with a press release under the slogan, Giyanek be heavy, derastiye be mirabek be denge. A life without hope in, is in reality a silent death. Their name, Havi, means hope in the Kurmanji dialect of Kurdish, the most widely spoken dialect of the otherwise systematically banned language in Turkey's Kurdistan. Havi's members have come together at the LGBT um, bloc during the Gizi protests, and they have been thinking about forming a newly structured political forum ever since. In an interview conducted by Fidan Bafe Mirhanoğlu and published on Bianet, Mehmet Umut, one of Hevi's members and co-founders, continued as follows, and I quote, our comrades and friends who have been forced to migrate and resettle in the west from Kurdish cities, towns and villages in the east, um, have never felt comfortable under the auspices of other queer and LGBT political and social organizations in the past. But now things are changing, end of quote. Through their manifesto, Hevi members named their initiative first and foremost as an anti-militarist political formation organized against authoritarian rule and violent oppression in Turkey. They also highlight that as an LGBTI organization, they see their contributions to the forum on the peace process as responsible, necessary, and critical interventions in the attempt to build an all-inclusive and sustainable peace process in the country. While having members question the political merits of presenting a priority list among peoples um, under uh, um, multiple groups of peoples under oppression and their problems, their press release reminds people in Istanbul of their particular obligation. In other words, heavy members invite their audience to approach the Kurdish issue and the latest capitalist class struggles in Turkey as the two vital fields for political cultivation, negotiation, and production. They close their manifesto with a double reminder for their readers. First, they claim, um, first, that they remain primarily an LGBTI organization based in Istanbul, committed to addressing Kurdish and other members' issues in, this, um, in, in the city, um, and that they're embedded in a web of alliances with other queer and LGBTI organizations in Istanbul, as well as in Diyarbakir, like Hebun and Keskeso. Second, that without facing up to the reality of Turkish state's imperialism in Kurdistan, they see no heavy or no hope. 
in producing egalitarian and emancipatory politics out of Gezi Park's expressive and explosive political momentum in Turkey. Yet how are we to approach this increasingly tangible alignment of Kurdish and queer politics in contemporary Turkey? Does Havi simply embody the expected synthesis of both, of both political factions after Gezi, that is the queer movement and the Kurdish movement? And what are the analytical frameworks at our disposal that could help us make sense of these seemingly strange alignments of queer politics and Kurdish, um, Kurdish politics in Turkey? Apart from Mas'ad's framework that equates the deployment of homosexuality in social life, let alone political action, with a categorical complicity in, uh, with imperialism, we're presented with just report so homonationalism is an alternative, as an alternative way to approach and analyze the relationship between state formation and queer politics, first in the global, global north, before it circulates to the global south. Punctuated by the, and I quote, historical convergence of state practices, transnational circuits of queer commodity culture, and human rights paradigms, as well as broader global phenomena such as the increasing entrenchment of Islamophobia, end of quote, Poor defines homonationalism as, and I quote again, a facet of modernity and a historical shift marked by the entrance of some homosexual bodies as those not worthy of protection by nation states, end of quote. This definition comes from a recent retort piece um, she co-authored with Maya Mittashi and published on Jadalia, written in response to Heike Schotten and Hanin Maiki's piece published in the same venue, and we heard about it a little bit before. The many constitutive elements of this important debate on positionality and authority, activism and the academy, categories of practice, and categories of analysis are too complex to be reconstructed here. Yet it's important to note how its author defines the analytical potentials of the term within the context of this debate. Poir, along with Mikdashi, Wright, and I quote, homonationalism is an analytical category deployed to understand and historicize how and why such a status, gay friendly, has become desirable in the first place. Like modernity, homo, homo nationalism can be resisted and resignified, but not opted out of. We're all conditioned by it and through it." End of quote. The toleration, protection, and valorization of LGBTI and queer bodies in Western European and North American geographies as the latest lit litmus test of a genuine commitment to the so-called democratic ideals of equality and liberty is an important phenomenon that requires careful attention in its own right, as Jesper Poir's work has demonstrated in terrorist assemblages. Yet what are the limits of its applic applicability? Even in Mas'ad's reading, Poir's work provides a remedy to the analytical paralysis that his work produces for political activists and sexuality scholars alike in the Middle East and empire of dairy, <clears throat> excuse me, empire of sexuality. In an interview republished by Jadalia on his framework, Ms. Ad claims that Poir's work does so by historicizing, and I quote, the specific nationalization of gayness in the United States and also in Europe, and the form of homonationalism and the imperial form of its inter inter um, inter internal, oh my God, internationalization, yay. Um, in other words, we're presented with first the genesis of the alignment of liberal democracy and protection of sexual minorities as a stable constellation, and then with its rendition as modular and transplantable in the rest of the world. From Obama's amendments to the don't ask, don't tell policy that opened the way um, for LGBT and queer individuals to serve in the military, to gay marriage debates, Poir's framework serves as a crucial cultural history of sexually based claim making in North, North America and Western Europe. Once we try to track its imperial inter internal internationalization, however, we're confronted with the specificity of its premises, namely the narrative of progression dating back to how particular collectivities have peopled the civil rights movement in the US by summoning certain identities as a way of producing tangible, tangible political um, results. What happens when we ask of Poir's otherwise culturally specific construct to serve as an analytical optic for understanding a novel facet of modernity on a global scale, one that can be resisted um, and resignified but not opted out of? Once abstracted and deemed sufficiently modular, in other words, Poir's coinage, homonationalism, provides very little analytical purchase on the multiplicity, ways, the multiplicity of ways in which sexuality 
and political action, let alone nationalism, are constellated in specific locales on a glo global scale. It might prove extremely helpful in approaching and analyzing Israel's gay-friendly status as an emblem of its alleged tradition and conduct of liberal democracy. Yet even before we make it to the global south, when it comes to the massive public protests against gay, gay marriage in France, or Russia's state-level state level intervention effectively banning homosexuality in the country, um, cannot be accounted for in this analytical framework that claims to capture um, an overriding facet of modernity on a global scale. Even a brief look at the formation of the Heavy Istanbul Initiative, their political stance, and the solidarity built between the LGBT and, and Kurdish liberation movements in Turkey point to a different constellation of political action, one that is informed as much by local histories of playmaking as it is by global human rights regimes and translocal networks of solidarity. Is homonationalism really as modularly pervasive and globally dominant as modernity or nationalism? This brings me to a slight detour on the idea of modularity as the precondition for the dominance, for that dominance as an effect of its transnational circulation. Anderson's imagined communities is concerned less with the origins and trajectories of specific nationalist movements than with the conditions that made possible conceptions of the nation as a dominant form and modality of governance. He locates the constitution of the concept of nation in a set of historical and cultural processes mediated via the novel institutional structure of print capitalism. Taking um, as his point of departure a conception of nationality, nationness, and nationalism as cultural artifacts, he identifies the main contours of his argument as follows, and I quote, the creation of these artifacts toward the end of the 18th century was the spontaneous distillation of a complex crossing of discrete historical forces, but once created, they became modular, capable of being transplanted with varying degrees of self-consciousness to a great variety of social terrains, to merge and be merged with a correspondingly wide variety of political ideological constellations." End of quote. Manu Goswami charges in her article called Reconceptualizing the Modular Nation Form, um, Goswami charges that Anderson's narrative about the modular nature of nationalism rests on a strong, if implicit, assumption of path dependency. That is the notion that temporally prior nationalist movements determine the dynamic trajectory of later nationalist movements, establishing a problematic hierarchy between source and destination, origin and copy. By, concept by reconceptualizing modularity, I'm sorry, by conceptualizing modularity as a universal process of mimesis, of self-identical replication and repetition through time and across space, rather than a historically constituted systemic dimension of the modern nation form, Goswami continues that Anderson causally and temporarily delinks the circulation of nationalist models from their ongoing context of production and reproduction, themselves shaped by the broader social, socio-historical processes and institutions, such as the dynamics of the modern interstate system the universalizing logic of capital, the institutionalized tie between nationhood and statehood. Instead, she proposes a reconceptualization. And she reconceptualizes modularity as, and I quote, transposability of collective repertoires of contention rather than as the mimetic transplantation of particular forms of collective action through time and across space, and, um, end of quote. Goswami recovers the conditions of possibility that made the translocal route of production, circulation, and reception in the first place, opening up the possibility of regulated improvisations of received modular forms within specific socio-historical conjunctures. Thinking of modularity as transposability brings into analytical view how, and I quote, the formation of a modular nation form in conjunction with the transnationalization of social relations transformed the terrain of subjectivity because it offered new resources, practices, and disciplines for the creation of novel political identities and ideational frameworks, end of quote. Before I return to the resonances of this critique for the modularity of homonationalism, let me briefly sketch out one more example of the queer alignments um, uh, of the uh, queer politics in Turkey. Um, on July 18th, 2013, 
at a moment when discussions about the grievances of Alevi citizens in the face of a Sunni Hanafi dominated state abound in Turkey, Prime Minister, um, at the time Prime Minister Erdogan, made public another one of his all knowing statements. And I quote They are trying to divide us as Alevi and Sunni. What's behind this discrimination? If Alevism is loving Hazrat Ali, I'm a perfect Alevi. Um, Hazrat Ali was a prophet's groom and a warrior. We will not be fooled by these provocations, incitements, and games. We will instead share with them our love for Turkey and our love for our nation." End of quote. Alevi's systemic dispossession by the state through the denial of state funding to Alevi institutions of religious practice, not recognizing Alevism in religious texts taught in state schools, and reducing Alevism to a folkloric or cultural color within Turkey's diverse communities are only part of the story here. And Erdogan apparently knows them all too well. Well, was there anything in Turkey, or in the world for that matter, that Erdogan didn't already know, and hence needed to learn? When Levent Pishkin, an LGBT and queer activist, and the um, HDP, this is the so-called the Kurdish parties, um, Bayola district co-president, heard Erdogan's all-knowing statement about Alevis of Turkey, he certainly thought so, that Erdogan had a few things to learn. In response, Pishkin tweeted in Turkish, I wait for the day Erdogan declares I'm a perfect Ibn Faget, and we don't, um, and we don't need to learn about, uh, we don't need to learn anything from you about being a faggot. Kisses. End of quote. He ended his tweet with the hashtag Anayasada LeBGT, um, referring to an ongoing campaign initiated well before the Gezi protests about LGBT and queer rights in Turkey's new constitution, which itself remains stalled in its drafting phase. Erdogan filed a lawsuit for slander propagated by a media against Levent Pishkin for the use of the word Ibn. In an op-ed piece penned for Bianet, Pishkin, a lawyer by trade, wrote that far from being a discriminatory word, Ibn was an identitarian term claimed by many members of the queer community in Turkey as evidenced by thousands of banners carried during the Pride March with the slogan, Velev ki Ibnes, and yet we're fags. Going back to Going back to uh, the Turkish Language Institute's dictionary that defines Ibn as a passive homosexual man, Pishkin asked when and when, uh, where and when does the use of a term that refers to sexual orientation constitute a personal slander. Pishkin also filed for an investigation of Erdogan's lawsuit maintaining that not his, his own use of the term Ibn, but rather Erdogan's taking it as slander itself constitutes a personal slander. He lost the fight. Uh, he lost the case. Some have argued that LGBT bloc's presence in the Gizzi protests now remains a distant memory of an extraordinary alignment with no tangible achievements gained since once promising gay revolution came to an end. I beg to differ. First, I want to suggest that such a conclusion obscures rather than reveals the history of queer communities' political struggles in Turkey that extends well beyond their presence in the Gizzi protests. Second, it ignores the ways in which Queer politics in Turkey have been transformed and reorganized after Gezi and moved beyond a strictly identitarian politics that only vocalizes the grievances of so-called sexual minorities. As the Ibn Court case exemplifies, the queer activists' intervention in an allegedly separate debate about state-sponsored religious sectarianism and systemic dispossession of Alevis charts out a different mode of conducting queer politics in Turkey and remaining in solidarity with other communities in doing so. And for those readers who are fans of hard political gains, or for those of you in the audience who are fans of hard political gains, it might be important to note that in Istanbul alone, the 2014 municipal elections listed, uh, lists featured six LGBT and queer candidates from JHP, the People's Republican Party, and HDP, the People's Democratic Party, in Istanbul alone, and led to the election of three queer political um, three um, queer politicians into municipal governmental institutions. Rather than indexing a co-option of queer politics by political liberalism then, these hard-fought gains point to ways in which a variety of oppositional political groups have been conducting politics anew in Turkey. By occupying the very structures that enable their oppression and attempting at, however incrementally, transforming them from within. And I'm concluding last paragraph. 
Neither the Masedian deconstructionist maze nor the mimetic homo nationalism exit out of it provide us with analytical purchase on what has been happening with LGBT and queer politics in contemporary Turkey during and after Gezi. To cast it in Goswami's terms, the modularity of queer politics in Turkey is better approached as a transposed constellation rather than a wholesale transplantation. And their struggles as a distinct interarticulation of historically sedimented trajectories of political struggles in Turkey on the one hand, and globally circulating forms of queer imaginaries of politics otherwise on the other. The path de dependency model that the homonationalism framework assumes further obscures the fact that the source of the political momentum that organizes, um, that organizations such as Lambda or Levi yield is their solidarity with other oppositional groups within Turkey as opposed to one forged with the infamous gay international or structures of political liberalism. From taking on the so-called Kurdish problem or intervening in debates on the Alevi condition in Turkey, Ibnes of Turkey re-embed and re-articulate queer politics anew. And they do so non-aligned to political liberalism and non-aligned to Western imperialism. Thank you. <laughs>